Yeah. <clears throat> yes? Yeah. Okay. Good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to the 13th and final lecture in the online series on East Caucasian languages developed and presented by the Linguistic Convergence Laboratory of the Higher School of Economics in Moscow. My name is Paul Phelan. I am finishing my graduate degree in West Circassian here at the HSC. Today, it is my pleasure to introduce Yuri Lander, who will speak on relativization in East Caucasian languages. Yuri is a professor of the linguistics department here at the, at the Higher School of Economics and a contributing researcher at the Linguistic Convergence Laboratory. His research is centered on morphological and syntactic issues in the Northwest Caucasian and East Caucasian language families, including Udi and Dargwa, and branches out into the grammar of Indonesian languages. Yuri is a prolific writer whose works have appeared in a variety of journals and include several contributions to Oxford encyclopedias and handbooks this year alone. Before I hand the microphone over to Yuri, I would like to remind everyone that the lecture will be recorded and request that everyone please mute their microphones to ensure good sound quality and few distractions. I invite you to send your questions for Yuri to the Zoom and YouTube chats, and he will answer them at the end of the lecture. Unfortunately, we may not have time for all of your questions, but they will all be sent to Yuri so that he can answer them at a later time. If you experience any technical problems during the lecture, please send those concerns to the chat as well. And without further ado, I give the floor to Professor Lander. Yuri, please take it away. Good evening, or good morning, or, or good afternoon. Uh, this depends on um, where you are. So thank you, Paul, for, for presenting me. Uh, and, uh, and, and first of all, um, I would like to say that, um, that I'm really happy to participate in this project, in this um, series of lectures. Uh, thanks to Nina, Nina Dablushna for organizing um, these, these lectures. Uh, so uh, they're really in interesting and third, in third inspiring. So um, let me share my screen and start uh, my, my presentation. Okay. Uh, so, first of all, I should make a disclaimer. Uh, 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 in fact, although I spent um, much of my life, uh, much of my life in love with relative clauses uh, and in love with East Caucasian languages, uh, actually, I, I have investigated uh, only three languages of the East Caucasian family, uh, namely Udi, Tanti Dargwa, and Mehweb Dargwa. Uh, so uh, today you will meet these um, languages uh, more frequently, uh, uh, but I will try to look at other languages, um, and uh, uh, there I will follow the, the the descriptions that we have. So okay, uh, what is what is a relative clause constructions? Let me. Okay. Uh, very roughly, what is relative clause? The relative clause is a subordinate clause which is used for the description of some participant of the situation or state of affairs denoted by the matrix clause, by the main clause, uh, and um, it describes this participant by a, his or her or its participation in some other situation or state of affairs. Uh, which is actually described by this relative clause. So, um, so, uh, so here are some examples of, uh, of relative clause constructions and, and subordinate uh, parts uh, here are in brackets. And uh, this convention uh, will be used throughout the lecture. Uh, so um, first consider uh, the sentence, this is a clause that is used for the for the description, and here roughly we have two situations or two state of affairs. Um, the first one is that this is something, this is a clause, this is 
uh, something. And the second situation is that uh, something is used for the, for the description. So, um, and, and we use the second, the second situation uh, for the description of some participant of the first, uh, of the first situation. Um, and um, the same um, is observed in the second example. This is a situation described by the clause. Uh, and what is important here is that, um, uh, is that I will assume following ma uh, much topological literature uh, that participles also uh, can, form, can form relative clauses. This means that uh, by relative clauses, I will also mean uh, participle constructions. And this is very important for East Caucasian languages. Uh, so, in fact, there is another white um, uh, naive understanding of what the relative clause is. Uh, this is that uh, relative clauses are attributive clauses which modify nouns. And actually, during this lecture, you can follow this, uh, this understanding. Uh, but uh, I would like to say that um, it does not cover all, all relative clause constructions. So, uh, so for instance, it, it does not cover the so-called headless or free relatives, like take what you find. Uh, here, we don't have any noun uh, that is modified. And also, it does not cover what is called correlatives, uh, which are illustrated here by the example from Hindi. Um, the girls who are standing are tall, uh, literally, which girls are standing, they are tall. All right, so in correlatives, relative, uh, the relative clause is not embedded in the noun phrase that describes this participant. So uh, here, the relative clause is not embedded into, uh, okay, into the noun phrase, something like this. So, uh, but, even then, below, um, I will speak mainly uh, about headed constructions, uh, and uh, I will speak mainly about non-correlatives. Non so let's look at, at the East Caucasian relatives at first glance. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, so, uh, uh, so most often we find pre-nominal participial clauses. Uh, so we find some clauses that precede their head nouns. As in this example from Sanji Darbo, and here we have uh, the uh, participial relative clause uh, slowly going, uh, slowly gone maybe. Uh, and this relative clause precedes the head noun boys. Um, but sometimes uh, participial clauses in East Caucasian relatives may appear postnominally. Uh, maybe not in all languages, but in many languages. Uh, and here is another example from Sanji Darwa, the snake that sat in a pit together with the rich Ismail. So, uh, so here we have the clause, uh, like in English, in fact. Uh, which sat in a pit together with the rich Ismail, and this clause uh, follows uh, the head noun uh, snake. So, okay. Mm, next, actually, in many East Caucasian languages, we also find correlatives. Uh, so, so, so here is an example from Tsahur. Whoever has not listened to the parents, uh, literally, for this person, there is no way forward, as we understand, of course. So, uh, and here we have uh, the, uh, something like a relative clause, um, whoever has not listened to the parents. But um, in fact, uh, such constructions are mentioned for many, many, many East Caucasian relative, uh, languages, but uh, uh, it seems that they are almost always peripheral, or in fact, uh, always peripheral. Uh, so um, today I will not speak about them. 
But of course, there was the uh, uh, investigation. And uh, fortunately, starting from this month, from this December, uh, we have a brief survey of the data for East Caucasian languages, uh, which is a part of um, Alec Belayev's um, Belayev and uh, Danhaug's um, paper on, on correlatives in language. Uh, so, and finally, uh, at least in the Vartashen dialect of Udi, um, we find simple, okay, simple, finite relative clauses. Uh, so here you see an example of this. Um, mm, that person who himself guided people brought Udis to Georgia, and here we have that person, uh, which, and uh, this relative pronoun uh, is based on an interrogative uh, pronoun, uh, and uh, the clause is embedded. But it seems that uh, uh, it's very likely that uh, this construction is a, a, is a contact-induced innovation, in fact. Uh, and I believe that it developed from, from correlatives, because, uh, for instance, a very similar construction in another dialect of Udi uh, looks uh, 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 much uh, more similar to, to correlatives. Okay, so uh, today, unfortunately, um, I will discuss only participial constructions. But in the future, please, please, please don't forget about other possibilities. Please don't forget about other constructions. Uh, um, this is important because uh, quite often people think about East Caucasian uh, as having only participial uh, constructions. This is not the case at all. So uh, now let's consider participles. Mm or maybe participles. Uh, actually, I'm not sure that uh, after this lecture, uh, you, will, um, you will prefer to call them participles. So, but let's assume that there are participles in uh, East Caucasian. Uh, and uh, first of all, I would like to say that uh, for me, it is convenient uh, to distinguish uh, between general participles and special participles. Uh, so uh, uh, by, by analogy with the distinction between general converbs and special converbs, again, recall Alec Belair's talk in this, in this, in this series of lectures. Uh, so uh, this distinction is not always accurate, actually, uh, but very roughly. Um, the idea is that uh, special participles are forms uh, which uh, function similarly to participles. Uh, they do form relative clauses, but they usually involve some peculiar semantics which does not easily fit into the paradigmatic uh, system. So, um, so general participles uh, are, uh, in fact, uh, nothing more than an attempt to construct a relative clause, right? So, uh, but special participles uh, may be of different kinds. For instance, uh, in some languages, there are locative participles, uh, which uh, refer to the location. There are resultative participles. Uh, there are potential participles, uh, like in tante dargua, uh, in this example, mammo, actually mammo, uh, who could do the worst things. Mm, so here we have um, the uh, participle uh, marked with the suffix an. And uh, uh, <clears throat> actually, this participle, or oh, participle, uh, has a, a very different behavior, uh, has behavior uh, which is very different from general participle. Uh, so, uh, and it also has some peculiar semantics. But it's interesting again that in some other Dargo languages, uh, this uh, participle marked with an uh, became 
an unmarked general participle. Um, so we see that uh, this distinction between general participles and uh, and special participles uh, is not that sharp, is not that clear cut. So, okay. Uh, another interesting example of a general participle, oh, of a special participle uh, is an optative participle in agu, um, which, actually, uh, which actually developed from, from a combination of the infinitive and the uh, participial form of the copula. Uh, so um, this participle actually describes the wish of the speaker towards the person or the thing that is described by the relative close construction. So, uh, so uh, here we uh, have a typical formula, of course, um, literally, to whom let this be Uncle Hamid, so the late Uncle Hamid, but uh, he would have this optative participle, uh, which uh, expresses the wish, the wish of the speaker. Okay. Uh, uh, so, in fact, uh, special participles are very, very, very curious, but um, for this lecture, they are two language specific. Uh, so, here I will focus on general participles. Uh, so, again, general participles are nothing more than an attempt to construct a relative clause uh, without any special semantics. So, uh, the general participles. Okay. Some languages uh, have dedicated participle forms. Uh, it seems that uh, sometimes uh, uh, these are just verbal stems uh, with the attributive morphology. So for instance, in Kodoberi, in these examples, uh, we, uh, uh, we first find a simple form waha uh, came, and then uh, in the B example, uh, we have some additional suffix, some suffix uh, which combines with this simple form, the participial suffix. So um, <clears throat> now, even if we assume uh, that the primary function of such dedicated participles is to construct relative clauses, even then, uh, in some languages, we find that uh, such dedicated forms can be used, uh, still can be used as predicates of independent clauses, uh, especially in narrow focus constructions, in argument focus uh, constructions and in shifted focus uh, constructions. So, um, Mm, so here is an example from Luck, mm, uh, uh, from a seminal paper by Konstantin Kazinin in uh, the Linguistic Typology Journal. Uh, so in the A example here, um, we, we find a relative close construction, uh, uh, the house built by Muhammad. Uh, so we find Muhammad built house, right? Uh, and, but in the B example, we find the same form, Dursa, uh, uh, which is used as a predicate uh, uh, of the clause, um, which means the boy has built the house, or it was the boy uh, who built the house, right? Uh, so uh, one can think that this looks like a cleft, uh, like a cleft construction, or like a pseudo cleft construction. Uh, but no, that uh, here we find that the focus also marked with the, uh, okay, copula-like element, actually. Um, <clears throat> uh, uh, here, uh, the uh, focused element, the boy, um, retains the case which shows that it is dependent on the verb, right? So this is not a cleft construction, actually. Uh, uh, so uh, this is likely to be a simple clause. 
Uh, okay, so in some other languages, we find uh, that very the same forms are found in clearly finite unmarked clauses uh, without any folks effects and so on. So, so for example, in Udi, in Udi we find the aorist form um, marked with the suffix e, like here, Hari came. Um, so the guest, uh, the guests came. Uh, and uh, the same form uh, is found in, in relative clauses, as is shown in the B example. And my friends that came from 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 Kiravabad. Okay, of course, probably this resulted from uh, uh, some kind of extension of the use of non-finite forms to new uh, contexts. Uh, but still, um, it's not at all obvious uh, that. Uh, that we can distinguish between participles and some uh, finite morphological uh, verbal forms here. Uh, and of course, a single language uh, may have both dedicated uh, participial forms and forms unmarked for um, finiteness. Okay, so um, further. It, it should be said that occasionally we find non participial forms as predicates of relative clauses. Uh, and, uh, and for example, it's uh, quite typical for East Caucasian languages uh, to use infinitives as predicates of, of relative uh, clauses, as in these examples from Ingush and from Tanti Dargwa. Uh, but also in these examples from English, of course. So I bought him a book to read. So in some sense, this is a very, very, very similar construction. Well, and, uh, and irrespectively, uh, uh, in, in fact, irrespectively of the um, verbal form, in fact, relative clauses may uh, lack some properties of finite clauses. So uh, uh, here we can think about finiteness as a property of a clause rather than as a property of a form. So for instance, um, we have already seen that uh, in Udi, uh, in past uh, or effective context, um, we have the, the same form marked with the suffix e both for independent clauses and for uh, and for relative clauses. Uh, but um, so so, for instance, in A, uh, we have a finite clause. Uh, first, she didn't give me um, an answer in Udi. Uh, uh, so uh, here we have this form, but we also have. Uh, personal agreement. Uh, and we also have the finite uh, negation marker tab. But in the, uh, in the relative clause, uh, the guest uh, who he didn't see uh, in the B example, uh, uh, we find that there is no personal agreement. And uh, and also, and also we find a different uh, marker of negation, uh, which is typical for um, non-finite clauses. So, okay, let me look at them. Okay. Um, another interesting story about non-finiteness uh, uh, concerns uh, marking of subjects. In fact, in some East Caucasian languages of Azerbaijan, some apparent arguments of relative clauses may take genitive case. So uh, usually uh, this is subject, and this is reported for uh, for Chris by Girotier, 
uh, and this is also found in Udi. Mm, so you see, in fact, uh, for Greece here, uh, we have a, um, a headless clause, but still the subject is marked uh, uh, by genitive. Mm, uh, what you want, uh, and you is marked with the genitive. And, a, and in Udi, this marking is optional. In fact, the, the house where I lunched uh, is nice. Uh, so uh, literally, my, oh, okay. Uh, mm, you can say either uh, uh, the house, uh, <clears throat> okay, uh, my lunch, I don't know. Uh, okay, uh, I will not even try to to translate this into English literally, but um, still. Uh, now it seems that uh, this is uh, this results uh, from uh, Azeri influence because uh, in Azeri some participles, many participles actually uh, require their subjects to be marked with genitives. And here we have an example of this. This has beloved girls, son in uh, uh, So um, here, uh, the subject of the participle, uh, isa, uh, is marked with the genitive. But it's interesting that at least in Udi, uh, things are not that simple. Uh, so in Udi, such uh, genitives actually uh, possibly are not parts of relative clauses, but at nominal possessors. So, and this is shown in this example, all cities where I have been. So uh, here we find that this genitive, uh, which, okay, semantically it refers to a kind of subject of the relative clause, but uh, still uh, here it functions as an abnominal possessor. And uh, the relative uh, clause in some sense simply specifies the possessive, possessive relation. Uh, so uh, uh, I'm not sure that uh, this can be counted uh, as some, uh, as any kind of evidence uh, um, for the idea that relative clauses are less finite or more non-finite depending on your perspective. So, um, well, take home language, uh, message. Um, oh, well, I wonder what kind of uh, relative this take home is in English. Uh, so, Maybe it looks uh, very similar to East Caucasian. But anyway, uh, first of all, the use of the term participle for East Caucasian is a matter of tradition. The uh, morphological and syntactic status of East Caucasian participles may vary. Uh, so, uh, in fact, sometimes uh, they're uh, probably not participles at all. And uh, finally, East Caucasian participial constructions are usually very different from standard average European ones. So and we will see this uh, in, in a moment. So, okay. Mm, the next part uh, of this lecture uh, concerns the relativized argument. So what is what is a relativized argument, if it existed? So the uh, relativized argument is the syntactic uh, role, usually it is considered a syntactic role in the uh, subordinate clause, and this is important. This is a role in the subordinate clause, uh, which corresponds uh, to the described participant. So um, you see in the first example, I met a tiger whose head was covered by a tremendous head. Uh, we find relativization of the possessor of the subject. So we have the subject, uh, uh, head, head was covered and head is the subject and its possessor is relativized. And in the second example, uh, I met a tiger which was wearing a tremendous head 
uh, we find, of course, a relativization of the subject. Uh, so, uh, since it was subject uh, who was wearing a, a tremendous hat. So it is very important to understand uh, that here we are not interested at all in the, in the corresponding role within the matrix clause, within the main clause. This is a very typical mistake, um, uh, or, which is found for uh, people who uh, first uh, come to the study of relative clauses. So, um, okay. Uh, now it is important that languages may show various syntactic constraints on uh, relativized arguments. So the, uh, uh, in many languages, we find certain rules which restrict what can be, what can be relativized. Uh, so for example, uh, <clears throat> Ed Keenan and Bernard Comrie uh, in uh, 1977, actually earlier, I think in 1972 or 1974, uh, uh, Proposed the well known, the now, the now well known um, hierarchy of noun phrase accessibility, which looks like a subject, then direct object, then indirect object, then oblique object, then possessor, and then uh, the object of comparison. Uh, so, um, roughly and inaccurately, we can say that uh, the higher a position is in this hierarchy, the easier it is to, to relativize it. Uh, this is not an accurate um, formulation, but uh, still for us, uh, for us, it is sufficient. So, uh, and we know that languages may restrict, restrict uh, in fact, relativization to the highest position. Uh, so for example, there are many Austronesian languages uh, which, uh, which only relativize subjects. And there are languages which only, only relativize sub subjects and objects, and so on. So um, further, it's interesting that uh, there are some, some correlations between the type of the relative clause construction and the position in the hierarchy. So for example, uh, participles uh, seem to prefer higher positions in this hierarchy. We know that, that for instance, in Russian, uh, participle, um, the participle um, can relativize only subjects. Uh, so, uh, and further, I would like to mention uh, some other uh, problem to which uh, we will return in a moment. Uh, so, uh, uh, this formulation of the hierarchy, uh, of course, has an accusative basis. So, and it, and it is interesting what happens in ergative languages, like Eastern Caucasian. So maybe there we will have uh, first absolutive arguments and then ergatives, as, as is sometimes claimed uh, since I think um, Christian Lemon's um, 1984 book. So, uh, so, okay, we will look at this matter shortly. Uh, and another story about uh, mm, the syntactic constraints on relativized arguments mm, concerns uh, the fact uh, that there are some constituents called uh, syntactic islands, uh, which actually cannot contain relativized arguments, uh, uh, as was first discovered by Hodge Ross in his dissertation in 1967. So, so, so for example, it, it is impossible to relativize an argument um, out of a relative clause. So uh, here, uh, uh, here you have a relative clause which was about something. And then we try to relativize this something, and this is impossible. Uh, 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 you cannot say uh, uh, the man who I read a statement which was about is sick. 
even though uh, you can say the man who I read the statement about uh, is sick. Um, and um, another canonical classical example of, uh, of a syntactic island is, of course, uh, the coordinate construction. Uh, so, so here is an, uh, here is another example from Ross, Ross's uh, dissertation: madrigals which Harry plays the lute and sings sound lowly. Uh, so this is uh, this sentence is impossible because uh, here we have a, 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 here we have a coordinate construction plays the lute and sings madrigals and then we try to um, uh, take some part of this coordinate construction and we fail uh, so uh, these are very interesting uh, syntactic um, constraints, uh, which um, for some times were thought to be universal. But we will see that they're not universal, uh, and East Caucasian languages uh, do violate them. So, OK, let's turn to, uh, turn to relativized arguments in East Caucasian languages. So first of all, uh, how? Uh, Mm. How do uh, we we express them? Or, uh, do the speakers of these languages express them? Um, we see that uh, uh, normally normally relativized arguments are absent in the relative clauses. They, in some sense, they are omitted. So uh, here we have an example from Tabasaran, uh, from a dissertation by Aiten Babaliva, uh, the boy whom I gave the book. And uh, here we find that uh, the recipient noun phrase uh, is absent in the relative clause. There is no recipient uh, noun phrase. And hence we can think, OK, uh, it was this recipient noun phrase that was that was relativized. Okay, uh, but the problem is that uh, these languages uh, are uh, what is sometimes called drop languages. That is, um, in these languages, any arguments can be omitted. Uh, so, uh, simple omission is not enough for recognizing what is what is relativized. This is shown in this uh, Huashi example. Uh, so uh, here we have the relative clause which uh, uh, contains just a participle and the noun phrase uh, money. And um, mm, here uh, we find that at least two arguments are omitted in some sense, if you believe in the emission of uh, noun phrases. So uh, first, uh, we find that uh, the ergative noun phrase is omitted, is absent, and then the recipient uh, um, noun phrase is absent. But then, uh, uh, either of these syntactic rules, or syntactic and semantic rules, uh, can be uh, third uh, as relativized. So uh, the sentence is ambiguous. It can mean either Patimat Imat knows the boy who sent the money or Patimat knows the boy to whom the money was sent. Um, by, by the way, uh, by the way, there is no passive voice in East Caucasian languages. So if you see a translation uh, which uses uh, the passive voice, uh, this is uh, simply something like uh, somebody sent money to me. Uh, so this is a kind of impersonal maybe. So uh, impersonal construction. OK, so uh, uh, <clears throat> Sometimes, actually, 
uh, in some languages and sometimes uh, in some contexts, uh, relativized expressions can be expressed by pronouns, which are called resumptive pronouns. Uh, and what is interesting is that uh, uh, most often these are reflexive pronouns, as in this example from Kunzik, the man who slept saw a dream. So uh, he will find that the subject uh, can be expressed uh, uh, by, by a reflexive pronoun, which marks that it's this role that is, that is relativized. Uh, and of course, the, in fact, the appearance of a reflexive uh, pronoun in this function may look unexpected uh, for many people who, who study resumptive pronouns, but it uh, should be said that uh, the use of reflexive pronouns as resumptive uh, is uh, not really widespread, I would say, but uh, uh, it is found in many Turkic languages, in Japanese, in Korean, uh, so it is found in some, in some languages. This is not a very, a very surprising fact about East Caucasian languages, but uh, in fact this may correlate with the broader use of reflexives as, com as compared to typical European languages, um, so um, reflexives uh, can serve as long distance, long distance uh, uh, pronouns. Uh, and okay, so uh, uh, I don't think I will uh, go into the details here, but interesting. Uh, so uh, this is uh, the most widespread situation in East, in East Caucasian languages. Um, but uh, uh, in some languages we also find uh, uh, we also find demonstrative pronouns actually also used as a simple third person anaphoric pronouns. Uh, uh, but in these languages they, uh, they can also be used as resumptives. As, uh, as in some European languages uh, uh, and also as in many languages all over the world. So uh, here is an example from Kwashi, the man that the girl gave a book to. Okay, uh, I think that uh, many examples in this lecture are about giving some book to somebody, but I'm sorry. Uh, so uh, literally the, we find uh, um, relative clause, a uh, uh, participial clause. Mm, you see, the man uh, to whom this is, uh, uh, to uh, that person, uh, to whom um, the girl gave a book. So, so we find a resumptive pronoun, uh, we find a demonstrative pronoun used as a resumptive. And it's interesting that uh, at least one language, Bagbala, um, uses both reflexive pronouns and demonstrative pronouns as, as resumptives. But sometimes in different contexts, and maybe uh, we will find time to, uh, to return to this. Okay, so uh, sometimes the, the relativized argument is absent. Sometimes it's submitted. Sometimes it is expressed as a resumptive pronoun, but sometimes terribly, it is impossible to postulate any syntactic position that is relativized. Uh, and this is a real scandal, of course, and uh, here is a classical example from Archie. Uh, they would not give us uh, the meat of the slaughtered ram. Uh, so uh, he would have the head meat and we also have a participial clause, uh, which means something like uh, somebody slaughtered a ram, the ram. Uh, so the real problem is that there is no room for meat here. There is no position for meat, for meat in this relative clause or in this, in this participial clause. 
And this is a real problem, of course. So, um, and our favorite example came from Denis Cressel, actually, in personal communication with uh, Mr. Daniel. So, our because um, we have written about this together with uh, Mr. Daniel. So, he will have uh, an example. We have a participle um, clause, uh, rain asking, or no. Uh, and then we have the head stone. But this does not mean a stone asking for a rain. This does not mean a stone to ask for a rain with. So this is not an instrument. Actually, in this context, in the relevant context, uh, this means something like a stone such as if it would be once lifted up, there would be no need to ask for the rain ever again. So what we see, we see that this is not about any relativized argument. Uh, this is about some semantic, uh, semantic association, um, uh, which is uh, based either on the context, uh, as in the second example, or on the lexical semantics of the head, as in the first example. Um, uh, uh, but there is no room for syntax here. So uh, uh, the idea is, okay. So, um, and this problem uh, was recognized actually by Alexander Eugenius Kibriuk already in 1918. Uh, so, in fact, uh, it was recognized already in the Archigram of uh, 1977, but uh, in 1918, uh, Alexander Kibriuk uh, writes, uh, uh, wrote that uh, actually East Caucasian relativization is not based on the syntactic characteristics. Uh, characteristics of any argument. Uh, so uh, this is not about syntax. I'm not sure, but we will see. Uh, so um, in 1999, Bernard Comrie and Marsha Polinsky uh, uh, published a paper on says relative clauses. Mm, and there, uh, they argued that, in fact, uh, for says relative clauses, the hearer has to assign a plausible interpretation to the association between the head noun phrase and an unexpressed constituent in the attributive clause. And if a plausible interpretation can be assigned, then the, result, uh, then the resulting relative clause construction is just acceptable. So um, we are looking for some associations. And uh, then in um, 2017, um, uh, Bernard Comrie and his co-authors and uh, uh, published actually a volume um, devoted to what they called general noun modifying clause constructions, uh, which is abbreviated as GINIMEX. Uh, this is pronounced as GINIMEX, as far as I know. Uh, so, uh, um, and um, in this volume, um, there is a paper on, uh, on Hinuk and Beshta, written by Bernard Comrie, Diana Forte, and Zaira Khalilova. Uh, and they actually argued that uh, East Caucasian so-called relative clauses represent general noun modifying clause constructions, which are not based on syntactic mechanisms. Mm. Uh, so, uh, and such, such constructions are actually found, for instance, in uh, Japanese and in Korean. And again, it's interesting that uh, they're found in many languages that use reflexive pronouns as resumptives. Um, but uh, this is just an observation. So, um, okay. Um, 
Yeah, and it's interesting that, uh, for instance, uh, Hajros in uh, 1967 illustrated uh, uh, syntactic islands uh, with some Japanese examples. But uh, later, uh, Bernard Combe showed that, uh, uh, and not only Bernard Combe, actually, uh, and others uh, showed that um, uh, syntactic islands can be evaluated in, uh, in Japanese. Okay, but let's return to East Caucasian languages. Um, so again, the idea is that East Caucasian so-called relative clauses are actually general non-modifying uh, uh, modifying clause contractions are actually genimax, and they are not based on syntactic mechanism, um, rather they are based on some semantic mechanisms. So what is evidence for this treatment? Uh, so uh, first of all, um, we find that for many languages, it is reported that everything is relativizable and there are no effects of noun phrase accessibility. The Keenan Comrie hierarchy uh, turns out to be irrelevant because it is about syntactic positions and GeneMax are not about uh, any syntactic, syntactic restrictions. Uh, so here are some examples from uh, Martin Haspelmatz Grammar of Lesbian, uh, which uh, show the uh, right end of the uh, Kim Comrie hierarchy. So he will find uh, he will find relativization of an inalienable possession, uh, the wife whose husband's car was stolen, uh, and also he will find relativization of an object of comparison. Uh, so where is the mountain that Shagdar is taller than? Uh, okay, uh, if you have time, I recommend you uh, to think about the semantics of this uh, sentence. Uh, at least for me, it seems that it should mean that the speaker is looking for a mountain uh, which is lower than Shardak. So, that's it. Uh, so, uh, everything is relativizable. Uh, at least uh, in Kinnan and Comrie's uh, hierarchy. Uh, so, and this is the first piece of evidence uh, for the Genimax treatment. Uh, moreover, it, it turns out that some languages even allow relativization out of canonical syntactic islands. Again, I illustrated syntactic islands with a relative clause and with a coordinate uh, constructions. And, um, uh, of course, of course, there are more syntactic islands, but and here I will illustrate this again with these uh, two types of islands. So uh, in Tanti uh, Darwan, we find a relativization out of a relative clause. So first in A, we find uh, a sentence which contains a relative clause. The cat which she uh, brought ran away. Uh, and then uh, we uh, take um, the uh, agent argument of the relative clause she she brought, uh, which which she brought. So um, we take this uh, argument and try to relativize it. We succeed. So uh, in B, we find something that probably should be translated as something like, the woman who the cat which she brought me ran away. Uh, imagine you are a native speaker of English uh, and imagine your reaction uh, to this. Uh, but uh, this is possible in Tanti. So uh, uh, you can uh, have a resumptive pronoun within a relative clause, you see. The woman uh, such that uh, the cat ran, which, who uh, uh, brought me. So uh, that's interesting, uh, but uh, this fits well into the Genomex picture. 
of course, because uh, uh, the genomic treatment uh, says that there should be uh, there should be no syntactic constraints uh, on uh, on attributive clauses. Um, so interestingly, yeah, it's interesting that uh, here the resumptive pronoun is optional, as you see. Uh, so uh, we, uh, and I uh, I asked several speakers about uh, this sentence, and in Tante they all agreed. It's okay. Uh, in fact, in uh, Tante d'Arbois, we even find a relativization out of a coordinate construction, uh, like in these examples. So in A, we uh, find a simple sentence, Ahmad and Musa, Maud A. But in B, we take Musa, which is a part of a, uh, of a coordinate construction, and try to relativize it. And wow, we can say something like the man Ahmed and who mowed the hay. So again, uh, I don't know. we can only cry out. Oh, oh my God. Um, <clears throat> uh, when uh, where have all the syntactic syntactic constraints gone? So, um, but this is okay for genome. So uh, then um, we have already seen that East Caucasian languages are regularly reported to relativize something, un something unrelativizable, uh, something that uh, we cannot recover. So um, here are simpler examples. Uh, here's an example from Agu, the smell of burning meat, literally, uh, meat burning smell. Uh, so we have a, a participle clause, uh, uh, meat burns, and then uh, we have smell. And, uh, and another example from Beshta, the preparation for my uh, travel to Moscow. So again, uh, uh, I go to Moscow, and then we uh, associate this with the word preparation of course, uh, uh, due to its lexical semantics. So again, there are no syntactic constraints and uh, these examples uh, seem okay. The fourth piece of evidence um, for the genomic interpretation comes from an experiment conducted by uh, uh, Maria Polinsky and her co-authors uh, and the results of this, of this experiment um, were published in 2012. Um, so it turned out that uh, for AVAR, for AVAR, they found no processing differences between the relativization of the ergative argument and the relativization of the absolutive argument, the patient argument of the transitive verb. So uh, you see, uh, the idea was that subjects should be relativized easier. But here, um, we find that uh, there are no processing differences. Uh, there are no difference um, in processing between, uh, between relativization of uh, what they think to be a subject and uh, between the absolute argument. And um, actually, um, they uh, provide some interpretation uh, for this, which is different from mine, but we can say that our relativization, relativization in our uh, doesn't depend on syntactic mechanisms, which uh, could could motivate such such processing differences. Uh, okay, uh, wait a minute. Uh, the fifth, the fifth argument. Oh, the genomic. Uh, interpretation is that, uh, and this is a very interesting argument, uh, it's that uh, in some, East, at least in some East Caucasian languages, at least in Tante Darba and in Archie, which we looked at, um, sometimes we can relativize several coindex participants at the same time. So we can 
have several, let me say, targets of, of relativization, which are coindex. But actually, uh, they're not several. Uh, there are several roles, but uh, they all correspond to a single participant because they are coreferent, they are coindex. Uh, and um, this, uh, at first glance, uh, this violates uh, Edward Keenan's uh, generalization on, uh, in fact, it was formulated in 1972 as a ban on multiple coreferent relative relative pronouns, but again, uh, so you see in this example from uh, Tante Darbo, uh, we have uh, two relativized, okay, two relativized arguments, let me say in this way, uh, they're both possessor, uh, possessors, uh, literally there came a man whose, uh, whose son, uh, carried whose wife. Uh, so this is of course impossible in English, and this is of course uh, impossible in, uh, I think, most languages. Uh, but this is possible in Tante Darqua, and this is possible in Archie. Uh, so, uh, and again, we can think that. Uh, this is due to the fact that these constructions are not based on any syntactic mechanisms. We are not interested, actually, in these uh, positions, in these noun phrases. These pronouns serve as a means of support, but what happens here is uh, just that we try to establish uh, some semantic association between the attributive clause and the noun. Okay, so, um, and finally, there is another interesting problem. Okay. Um, actually, um, there is a problem with the fact uh, that for several East Caucasian languages, it is reported that resumptive pronouns can appear uh, even where the highest position uh, in the Kinnan Comri hierarchy are, are relativized. So, uh, so, so here is an example from Chechen. Um, Rebecca, who had made him drink water, and uh, he will find, um, will find relativization of the agent. So, uh, uh, and the problem is that actually cross-linguistically, pronoun retention or presumptive pronouns uh, usually appear as a means of support when a given position is not easily, easily relativizable syntactically. That is, uh, when this position is either, for instance, in some weak syntactic island or it is in, um, it is low on Kinnan, uh, Kinnan and Combe's hierarchy and so on. But here we do find resumptive pronouns uh, um, at the top. Uh, so actually, it should be said here that um, then uh, these resumptive pronouns, when they appear in these positions, they uh, don't don't constitute the default constructions, uh, possibly because uh, the because of the typicality of the highest positions, and um, uh, but uh, still. Uh, they are possible then, and this may uh, serve as a piece of evidence that um, there are no formal grammatical rules about the use of such presumptive pronouns. And the, in some sense, in these languages, presumptive pronouns uh, uh, need not make any distinctions between different syntactic positions. So, okay, uh, we have five six pieces of evidence uh, that uh, what we used to uh, consider relative clauses in East Caucasian are actually GeneMax, are actually general non-modifying uh, clause, uh, clause constructions, which are based mainly on semantics and not on any syntactic rules. But should we 
abandon the syntactic treatment of these constructions at all. Don't harm. Uh, actually, there are also arguments uh, against this view, against the genomic treatment. And let's uh, look at them. So, um, for instance, there are certain asymmetries between different syntactic positions concerning the frequency of their, their relativization. Uh, that's okay. This, uh, this uh, does not mean that uh, uh, that um, mm, that we should abandon the genomic treatment. But what is interesting is that in many languages, uh, in many languages we have data uh, on. Um, we find that uh, transitive absolutive arguments are uh, transitive patient arguments, absolutive arguments, are relativized much more frequently than ergative arguments. But in UDI, in one language that we looked at, ergative arguments are relativized more frequently than transitive patients. So uh, in UDI, we have typical subjects. So, and this is actually in harmony with the fact that East Caucasian languages occasionally show other traces of syntactic ergativity, but not Udi. Uh, Udi um, was affected by accusative languages, uh, Armenian and Azeri, and uh, it shows more traces of uh, the uh, intransitive subject, uh, transitive agent pivot, uh, so of the accusative system than many other East Caucasian languages. So in some sense, it seems to be uh, more syntactically accusative than other East Caucasian languages. But it seems that this is reflect, uh, reflected in the frequency of the relativization of different positions. And here is some data and references. Let me drink some water. You can uh, look at um, some numbers. Okay, uh, but uh, uh, I'm not going to uh, comment on them, actually. So. Uh, even more importantly, and even more important evidence against the genomic treatment, the semantically based treatment of uh, East Caucasian relative clauses is that actually East Caucasian languages are not all alike with respect to their relative clause-like constructions. So they differ, and uh, they differ in some interesting respects. Uh, and of course, if we have just semantics, we don't expect any differences, right? So in fact, uh, some languages are even reported to prohibit relativization of certain positions. Uh, so for example, uh, as Pavel Rudnev showed, Avar uh, doesn't allow relativization out of some converbal master clauses. Uh, Beshta and Hinu uh, similarly uh, don't, don't relativize uh, the object of comparison. And in fact, uh, there is some discussion about, uh, about relativization of postpositional um, objects uh, and so on. So sometimes in different grammars, we do find some mentions that something is prohibited, that there is a syntactic constraint. Also in many languages, we find that uh, only inalienable possessors uh, can, be, can be relativized. Mm, but uh, this may be a semantic factor. This depends on, uh, uh, on how, on your treatment of Inalienable possessors. Uh, so at least we find that syntactic position can matter in some languages. Mm, okay. Uh, moreover, it turns out that East Caucasian languages differ in the 
in the distribution of resumptive pronouns. And, uh, and it's interesting that we find this uh, even within one branch. So uh, here are some uh, quotations from the grammars of uh, various Dargo languages. And you know that uh, uh, Dargo languages are even uh, considered sometimes as a single language, as a, um, a set of dialects. But uh, here, let's look at Itsari Dagwa. Uh, Nina Sumbato and Rasul Mutalov uh, tell us that that a pronominal support, that is resumptive pronouns, pronominal support is typical for Itsari. And actually the only uh, case when a resumptive pronoun would be ungrammatical is a relativized intransitive subject. Sanchi Dargwa. Diana Forkin finds that examples in which the nominal head itself is expressed by a reflexive in the relative clause were just as not very well formed, uh, not, not very well formed sentences. In Tanki Dargwa, uh, I found that resumptive pronouns are easily allowed in all positions, right? But in Mehweb Dargwa, I found that resumptive pronoun, uh, that uh, many speakers, not all actually, but many speakers uh, prohibit uh, resumptive pronouns at the highest positions uh, of Kinnan and Komri's hierarchy. So, uh, and the last two examples, of course, show that the distribution of, of resumptive pronouns uh, does, not, does not correlate with a linguist who, who studies them. So, uh, both, uh, both situations have been observed by me, myself. Uh, so uh, we see that uh, there are some rules. And further, we find that uh, different languages may grammaticalize different rules restricting the use of resumptives. So for instance, we find that, uh, strange enough, but in Mehweb Dargwa, resumptives are only possible when an animate argument is relativized. Uh, so, there is a very strict uh, uh, rule, grammatical rule, formal rule, that prohibits uh, um, relativization of inanimate uh, arguments by means of resumptive pronouns. And in Babalal, both reflexive and demonstrative resumptives are possible, as we know, uh, but um, they're both possible, for instance, in relativization out of complement clauses, but only demonstrative, uh, demonstrative resumptives are reported in, in relativization out of adjunct clauses. So uh, this means that not only semantics is important, but formal rules are important too. And so let's conclude. This Caucasian relative close constructions uh, can be used, uh, can certainly be used when the association between the subordinate clause and the metric clause is not based on any syntactic mechanisms. So, and hence, uh, to some extent, they may represent a subtype of general noun modifying clause construction rather than relative clause constructions proper. But still, East Caucasian languages uh, show considerable variation in the degree to which formal, not purely semantic factors play a role in relativization. So there is no definite conclusion, actually. So um, uh, this is, uh, we still should think about this. The hope we will do. So, and finally, I would like to uh, just to mention um, several uh, sujets, uh, several stories. Mm. Uh, related to our topic, uh, but, uh, but I'm not going to discuss them here. Uh, first, uh, this is a story uh, that adjective phrases uh, probably maybe in East Caucasian languages, or at least in some East Caucasian languages, probably should be treated as a subtype of relative post constructions. So for instance, uh, uh, they even allow resumptives in some languages. So, um, 
Next, uh, there is one interesting thing both for uh, morphologists and for syntacticians that um, predicates of relative clauses in some languages uh, can simultaneously agree in class and number both with their absolutive arguments and with, and with their heads. Uh, and uh, finally, and finally, there is another another story uh, story about uh, formal differences related to restrictivity and contrast. Because uh, contrast or restrictivity, uh, this is debated um, in some languages, in many languages, um, not closely related languages, um, are expressed by special morphemes. Uh, and this is also reflected in the relative clauses system. So, okay. Uh, and of course, there are many uh, open questions, many, many open questions, but I consider this lecture uh, as a kind of bridge to the next year uh, when we hopefully will be able to continue our study. So there are many open questions for the next year, 2021. So, okay, see you in the field. Thank you. Thank you, Yura, for the informative and interesting lecture. Um, for those of you who have not, please get your questions in and we will now uh, take a moment for, uh, to present Yura with your questions and comments and, and have him answer. So please get your questions in, we will get them up, um, get them up now. Yura, if you could please take a look here. There we go. These are some of the questions that came in while you were speaking. Okay, uh, so uh, let's start with your next question. Uh, what do we gain by considering attributive clauses, correlatives, and headless relatives uh, to be one class, one category? Uh, so, for example, when considering that headless relatives are used as complement clauses. First of all, uh, if we move to the West Caucasus, we find that uh, there uh, we can find uh, even headed relatives uh, used as complement clauses uh, in some uh, contexts. But um, still, uh, so of course. Uh, 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 I think that um, so uh, this may be represented as a kind of uh, we can think about this in different perspectives. Of course, it makes sense to think about headed as a uh, phenomenon of uh, uh, still if we want uh, about localization patterns, about the diachrony, um, about the uh, technological diversity. You're um, wrong. You're wrong. You excuse me for interrupting. Your sound is not, stops coming through very clearly. Could you please repeat some of what you have just said? Just said. Um, okay. So, uh, uh, do we hear me now? Do you hear me now? Paul? Yes, we do. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, okay, actually, I can <laughs> approach to you, but. <laughs> um, okay, so um, I just meant that, uh, of course, uh, 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 of course, uh, there is some sense in uh, thinking about headed relatives uh, as uh, something, uh, uh, as a separate phenomenon. But, uh, but there is also much sense in, in thinking about, about correlatives and headless relatives and, uh, and attributive clauses as a single phenomenon. So uh, this depends on our perspective. Uh, are optative uh, participles like the one in Agul often encountered in the world's languages? Uh, okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Joanna, for your answer. I don't know, actually. Uh, so. 
Um, so and uh, and uh, I don't know anything about uh, this this construction in Abu. Uh, so uh, okay, uh, I think uh, this is a good topic for uh, 2021. Can mm -hmm. uh, Filippo was slide 12. Uh, uh, so the, uh, this is uh, this seems to be the lab example. Yes, the third singular suffix enclitic uh, couple like element uh, seems to be a, a grammaticalized focus marking. Yes. Um, all done. Well enough. Um, in Udi, it seems that you have. Uh, in demonstratives and uh, uh, okay, I uh, unfortunately uh, I can comment on this. Uh, I have not thought about this. Uh, so and uh, Lauren and Timur uh, gave some references. Mm, let's look at, at other examples. Could, what formation? Of course. Uh, uh, well. You see, uh, I think that uh, quite often when we have uh, participles, um, it's not that easy to distinguish between uh, some kinds of lexicalization and some kinds of word formations some kinds of compounds and um, productive syntactic rules. But uh, here we see, uh, uh, so uh, the, um, of course they are, the story of the rain asking stone. Uh, uh, so this is a fixed expression. It is, uh, as far as I understand, it is it is lexicalized. Uh, I'm not sure, of course, because uh, because um, this is not my data. But um, but this does not uh, prevent us uh, to uh, look at this uh, in the context of the whole of the whole story of GMX. A uh, question about the comparative example on slide 29. Uh, this seems to be about uh, um, Shadab Mountain. Is it the object of comparison that is relativized or the standard of comparison? Uh, okay. Uh, of course, Tanya, you you are a specialist in, in comparatives, but uh, 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 at least in many studies of relative clauses, uh, the object of comparison and the standard of comparison uh, are used as um, synonymous, synonymous expressions. So uh, uh, there we have an example uh, which Shardar uh, is higher than. So, uh, so we take the standard in a sense. I'm not sure, so Timu says, uh, I, I'm not sure I understand why uh, multiple resumptives, I think, uh, contradict the general, generalization about multiple relative pronouns. Um, genitive reflexives uh, are a normal way to say his, her, uh, why you treat them here as relative pronouns or or resumptives. Of course, I treat them there as uh, as resumptives, uh, and um, because they refer to the participant, uh, which is referred by the whole noun phrase. They uh, uh, so they're in a sense co-indexed or co-referenced uh, with the participant of the matrix clause, uh, which is under under discussion. Uh, maybe, maybe uh, I have not understood your uh, question, but we will we will have time to discuss this. Uh, so, um, Sarah, uh, um, I'm wondering what you think. Some things that need to happen to help reach a conclusion about how to classify relativizing constructions in East Caucasian languages. Well. Um, 
I had to discuss my own view, actually. I just uh, tried to present uh, some arguments for and against uh, the epigenomic treatment. I think that uh, different languages uh, may, may, in fact, grammaticalize, uh, that is, introduce some formal grammatical rules um, uh, to a different extent. I mean that, uh, of course, uh, in some sense, uh, these languages are similar, but in some other sense, they're different. Uh, because different rules uh, may, be, may be grammaticalized in different languages. But that's, uh, that holds for the whole world. Okay, Gilles uh, tells us that uh, postponed relative clauses are usually descriptive. Um, this is no, uh, this means non non restrictive. Uh, this is not always the case. Uh, 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 at least for Tante Dagua, this is not always the case, and um, there are different stories about uh, those postponed relative clauses. Uh, some people claim that they should be. Uh, 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 they, they, uh, they reflect some contrast, some mm, they express some contrast, some people say uh, they are more likely for heavier relative clauses, and this is natural, but um, it seems that there are different factors uh, which may affect the position of the relative clause. So, uh, uh, and these factors may vary from one language to another. Uh, of course, uh, of course, of course, Xenia Chagall's book is relevant. Um, yes, yes, specialized participles uh, are very understudied, very understudied, and uh, uh, I think that this is a great topic for a dissertation. And uh, of course, I agree with you, Jim. Yes. Thank you. Uh, before we leave, there are some of the other questions coming in. Let me go to them if I can. Um, I know it appears that all uh, best wishes. Um, in that case, uh, if there are no more questions, um, thank you, Yura, for answering the questions. Thank you for your lecture today. Thank you to all of your, to all of our listeners for, for your questions and for taking the time to be with us today. And indeed, um, the entire Linguistic Convergence Laboratory thanks you for being with us uh, through all of these lectures and the online series on East Caucasian over this past year. Uh, best wishes to all in 2021. Thank you. Happy New Year. Happy New Year.